Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here and here is... Becky! Alright, okay. We had a quite busy week this week. We had SIPA numbers for the end of the year, we had some prototypes, we also had Nikon financial results. Now, we're not going to talk about Nikon financial results, so I'll spare you at least for this week. We're going to do a proper setup next week where I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation, graphs and charts and you name it, but at least SIPA numbers we'll do this week. Let's start with the main announcement. So we've seen the prototype of 85 1.2 lens. Now this one potentially may have a defocus control feature as well, similar to 105 and 135 F2 DC lenses. Yeah, so the details on the lens design, obviously it's just a patent, so we don't know if this is going to be the final design. Lots of things could change in the meantime. I won't read the patent number because that would be very boring. Yeah, yeah. But there are several different designs described in the patent application. So some details for you. We've got the focal length of 84.7 millimeters mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. An aperture of f1.22. So I suppose they have to get it down to the very fractions of a millimeter in terms of the size of the aperture. Mm -hmm. But that would mean that it'd be 1.2. The angle of view is going to be 28.42 degrees. The takeaway from the details is that the length of the lens is going to be 13.2 millimeters. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. So 13.2 millimeters, that's quite a small lens, isn't it? It's not that big. I don't have my ruler here. No, but if you imagine a CD case, so CD case normally is 12 centimeters. So if you imagine another one and a half centimeters, so then you'll get there. So that's Two. pretty small, but I assume it's going to be quite chunky. So could be 77, could be even 82 millimeter diameter. The most right. exciting thing I would say is that, yeah, we may have the defocus control features coming back. So in a paragraph 57, according to Nikon Rumors, which translated the whole patent, they say, problem to provide the optical system, which has plurality of focusing states with different aberrations amount at given shooting distance at which can control a given aberration amount without affecting the focusing. So do you understand anything of this, Becky, please? Uh, <laughs> not when you read it. Please understand, <laughs> Becky, please. <laughs> I understood it when you read it aloud. I read it, I, I understood it when I read it to myself. So I feel like I understand less every time I read it. So essentially what they're trying to tackle is providing a lens which, when it's focusing, it says focusing different states mm -hmm. that it will provide or there will be an optical issue. So they're trying to provide a, a system where you won't get any optical aberrations if you're shooting with different focus controls. I think that's one thing that the, the DC lenses really struggled with because mm -hmm. the 105 and the 135, if you shot your aperture, as you probably remember, if you shot your aperture at a different aperture to what the defocus control was set at, you'd end mm -hmm. up with a soft mm -hmm. image or you'd end up with huge chromatic aberration. So maybe maybe it's in reference to that. Absolutely. What I'm thinking is, I actually, I've seen uh, the videos on YouTube where people are actually comparing the effect of defocus control on those lenses shot by shot. So if I, if I will find that video, I will leave the link for that video below so our viewers can compare those. What's interesting to me, obviously, because it's going to stop down to 1.0 and it seems like that Nikon is going to go to 1.2 range and skip the 1.4 all the way, which obviously is going to hurt financially, me personally. But it looks like at 1.2 the depth field is going to be quite shallow. But what they say is that at 1.2 you're going to get low contrast at the edges of the frame, which is suitable for portraits, but it seems like it's going to be quite soft in the corner. So for portraiture, yes, at very shallow depths of field, potentially from f2 upwards we will start to see a huge improvement in terms of uh, resolution of the lens itself on the lens yeah so here it is yeah the patent has been published as with all the patents we normally see those uh, published on so that this one wasn't as with all the patents it may materialize it may not but it seems like it's actually quite close to reality because obviously we've seen the silhouettes of h5 1.2 on the roadmap of the lenses it seems like it's supposed to be announced at cp plus in yokohama later this month However, I don't think it's going to happen. I'll tell you why later on. We will talk about CP+, Plus, but it seems like it is coming. And uh, well, for me personally, hopefully sooner rather than later, because it is time for me to start to save up. Now, Bex, I want to ask you, uh, what about you? Like, So we've talked with Matt a couple of weeks ago, and obviously he loves 51, so you love 51 too. Are you in love with 85 1.2? 85 is a tough focal length for me because I don't actually do that much portraiture. Any portraiture I do is kind of incidental. It's not mm. that I would go out of my way to do portraiture. So I I don't know if this one 
is gonna if anything i'd like a 35 1.2 you know i love my 35 mm, mils mm. and my wider angle lenses anything mid-range so 85 is kind of interesting i mm -hmm, always mm -hmm. loved as a portrait focal length the 105 for example mm -hmm. so the 105 dc the 105 1.4 are amazing nice, i think nice. that based on the results that i got from the 51.2 or that i've i've i have gotten uh, and my experience with it this lens is going to be phenomenal though if it if mm. it does transform into reality it's going to be an absolutely stunning lens that any portrait photographer will want so it's very exciting well i am excited myself because 85 is kind of my bread and butter lens and i still hold on to my trusty h5 1.4 g i also had 1.5 1.4 uh, back in the day but i sold it because i prefer 85 focal distance myself and do like to take maybe 135 at some point and for our viewers, if you haven't seen our comparison of 135 Nikon F2D lens with Sigma 135, do check out the video that we published on weekend uh, for comparison. I personally look uh, for 135Z lens as well, but I think if I'll save up enough for h 51 1.2, which first I obviously will compare with my 1.4G, but it seems like the, the upgrade pattern for me has been set by Nikon. So fingers crossed, hopefully we'll get it very soon. Absolutely. Next up, let's talk about deliveries, not just of the Z9, but of lenses as well. I've had a lot of emails. I probably had, uh, and this is just an average, about 50 emails in the last four mm -hmm. days since I've been here, five days since I've been here, asking me where their stuff is. I don't know because I'm not there. Um, <laughs> but uh, The Z9, we did get another tiny delivery. It was, you could count it on one hand, but the, the positive side is that they are trickling through. I'm hoping we will get another delivery in February, hopefully more sizable than the first one but thus far we've only had one delivery a month since december so mm -hmm. we're slowly making progress through those the 100 to 400s which i know are on a lot of people's minds are trickling through slightly more frequently but we're only getting ones and twos and that's sort of every fortnight roughly mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. again with with the number of pre-orders that we have it's slow progress but at least it's progressing mm -hmm. okay 24 120s now we've cleared all the back orders so essentially oh, yes. when someone yes. orders yay so when we actually get a new order in usually there's just a small sort of lead time but whatever comes in next whatever delivery comes in next you get your lens same situation with the 105 macro now which i can tell you we've been getting one a month since release wow. one a month yeah. since the okay. very first okay. batches so finally have managed to clear the back orders on those and this is obviously very gray specific there will be other companies that have different waiting list systems different lengths of pre-order lists they may have cleared their back orders before us i'm just literally talking about mm. grays but it does give you an idea of the kind of uk delivery situation FTZ twos are in mm -hmm. stock now oh yes oh yes i've seen those hundred FTZs coming in and the whole shop is now stuffed with the FTZ2s everywhere. So you, you open a cabinet to grab a coffee mug and there's FTZ2 box in there. So they just spill out. Exactly. So, but just to clarify, so we, you've mentioned that's one, one of five macro lens coming in. So it doesn't mean that we only sold 12, right? So we obviously cleared a bunch of back orders that were there, but then the deliveries have slowed down after the initial first batch. Is that correct? Yeah, the first batch was small, but we've now finally cleared the back orders. So every delivery that we get in, we only get one unit, but at least it means that if you order one, you'll most likely be the next one up to receive one. So mm. the waiting time isn't quite as long as it has been. Yes, yes. Okay. And then on Z9, we own basically, we've, done, we've got about three deliveries in UK so far yeah. so and hopefully uh there will be more in the future so but by the way just so you know that if you go to dp review forums and obviously the inter internet detectives are there and they are tracking the z9 serial numbers to find out how many z9s were shipped and uh, if you go to photosynthesis website you know the the ones that we use for to track our lens hood for which lens hood goes to which lens so he tracks it as well so if you do want to do your research, I'm going to put a link in the description under this video. So do check this uh, forums out. And the, if it progresses even more, we may talk about it more in the future as well. Great. All right. So the next one up is uh, um, a small news that we haven't mentioned. And it's more of a public service announcement on Z 400 millimeter f2.8 lens. In the press release that Nikon officially issued with this lens, there is a health warning. So the warning says that do not use this product if you have a pacemaker 
or other medical devices. The magnets in this product could cause medical devices to malfunction. According to GP Review, it is the first press release from any camera manufacturer that states a health warning, especially for the pacemakers and similar devices. Now, Sony uses similar technology, so they use magnets there as well. It seems like they're not published this warning, so the question is, does Nikon use a stronger magnets or there's something else? in the play. So just to clarify what the pacemaker is. So the, the pacemaker is the device that sends electrical pulses to your heart to keep it breathing regularly and not too slowly. Having a pacemaker can significantly improve your quality of life if you have problems with slow heart rate. The device can be life-saving for some people. In the UK, the pacemaker implementation is one of the most common types of heart surgery carried out, with many thousands of pacemakers fitted each year. Thank you very much, Tilly, for pitching in. So this information <laughs> is from NHS, so National Health Service in the UK. Obviously, it is a clear issue with people who have pacemaker devices or similar devices fitted in. So it is more of a public service announcement saying that do keep that in mind. If you do have such a device, you may want to avoid this lens. One thing I will add to that is that obviously Nikon have put a health warning on their lenses. Nikon deal and have a whole health section of their company. So I think that mm -hmm. they would be maybe a little bit more conscious of warning the general public about this. Not necessarily that they have stronger magnets. And to be honest, obviously, nobody's going to actually test this out who has a pacemaker and rightly so, because that would be very dangerous. But I'd be interested to know if the reason why they put a health warning is because they work in the health sector and therefore have a little bit more kind of mm. are a bit more health conscious, let's say. Okay, well, I'd rather agree. I'd rather have the health warning than not having it at all. Exactly. So it, I think it's rather be safe than sorry, isn't it? Exactly. Next up, we have uh, some rebates for F-mount lenses in Nikon USA for the month of February. So you can get anything from $50 off your 85mm f1.8. This would be the mm -hmm. G, obviously, up to $150 off the 35.14 and the 58.14, and then $200 off the 28.14 and the 105.14, which are my particular favorites on that list. <laughs> Absolutely. They're all fantastic lenses. So I think it's a uh, good time to buy those lenses because, yeah, they're all 1.4s. They're all extremely sharp, but yeah, the 28 and 105s are my favorite on the list, but also 58 has a, such a good rep as well, because as people say, it may not be the sharpest lens in the world, but it is the lens with a character. And if you're a portrait or wedding photographer, that's what you need. The character is what you're after. Absolutely, it's a must have. All right, well, from rebates to price increases. Yeah, we've gone to the opposite end of the spectrum here. So Nikon rumors have reported that Nikon are set to increase their prices in Europe and the UK. Apparently this is coming into effect on April the 1st, and Nikon rumors actually quite quoted a letter sent out to customers by Nikon UK. So, should we have a little look at what it says? Yes, absolutely. What they say is, Dear Nikon customer, we would like to inform you that with the fact from 1st of April 22, in Northern Europe, we will be implementing a price increase on all imaging cameras and lenses. Now, this will exclude sport optics, so binoculars, and rangefinders, accessories, so that's for cameras, and certain new products such as Z9. So Z9 at least is good. What is the reason for that? What they say is, following a period of severe disruption in global supply chains, we have experienced continuous cost increases to component parts and logistic charges. Whilst we have explored all options to absorb this cost to maintain production on these lines moving forward, we are regrettably having to increase the prices. We appreciate such adjustments present significant challenge for our retail partners and photographers and assure you we have not taken this decision lightly. Obviously, we have quite a lot of items on back order. We have a lot of items that we're waiting for. So they have kind of implemented a tiered system of what will be honored at the lower price or the, the current price, I should say, and what stock mm -hmm. will actually be affected by the stock changes. The cutoff time for us receiving stock that uh, we've had back ordered at the current price has already passed, but mm -hmm. anything that, that we order that is then delivered, invoiced and delivered between now and the 31st of March will be honored at the original prices. So it will just apply to any orders that come in now that are invoiced after the 1st of April, essentially. All right. So while we don't have um, specifics on which cameras and lenses have accrued, will be increasing price from 1st of April. It seems like Nikon says that they will update this information and they will also issue a proper uh, recommended 
sale price list in the second half of February. Okay, well, just to confirm, so if this price increase come from Nikens. When we will know more, we will definitely share more information with you. Now, just to say that it's not only Nikon that's increasing their prices. Canon has recently increased their prices on their lenses, and apparently it's a second price increase from Canon in the last six months. So not just Nikon, it seems like every other manufacturer is struggling with the supply chain and logistics uh, of during delivering the goods to the customer. Though things tend to happen, obviously inflation is going up, interest are going up. It seems like that is getting harder and harder to be a human. <laughs> it's harder and harder to be alive. <laughs> Our takeaway from this is that if you can get hold of your beloved Nikon equipment before the 1st of April, then just go ahead and do it. There's no point in paying more for the same thing if you can help it. So I would I would advise that, not financial advice. <laughs> Absolutely, but I do approve this message. I agree. If you have a particular lens that you want to buy and you know it's going to increase the price for 1st of April, do place your order now. Obviously, if you've got everything, even your Z9 and 105 Macro, then you're set to go. Exactly. All right, the next one up is more of a UK news again. So Nikon issued a warning about suspicious emails being sent to YouTube and Facebook channel owners like us imitating Nikon public relations. <laughs> it's funny that actually they sent a warning about this because we've had these emails from everything from Nikon to Canon to Sony. I like your channel, it looks really great. <laughs> yeah, I'm a manager from Nikon UK. The email comes from Czech Republic. Republic. Yeah. Exactly. So what they've said is it has come to our attention that people pretending to be Nikon representatives are contacting YouTube and Facebook channel owners via email. The fraudulent correspondents generally carry Nikon's name and or refer to the Nikon Public Relations Department, requesting that the recipient produce a video using a Nikon camera or offer sponsorship opportunities. These emails bear no relation to Nikon or any members of the Nikon group. As we receive these all the time, my question is, Con, what are they trying to achieve by doing this? What what do they hope to get out of sending these dodgy emails? Well, if you are young and inexperienced YouTuber in the UK or all over the world, you may find out that people contact you for this, may want to get some money of you. The general scam is they say, we want a partnership. You say yes, and they say, well, before we send the goods, we need some sort of deposit or you need to pay the, the shipping cost, etc., etc. And that's how they get you. Now, Becky, would you like to do some PUBG or Fortnite commercial? Because we've got those as well. Oh, yeah, let's do PUBG. Let's just do a Fortnite commercial because that makes total sense. It's very on brand yeah. for um, us. I'm doing the whatever, Flop. the flossy dance. Yes. Yeah. I don't the know the name. Dance. Yeah. So <laughs> obviously, yeah. <laughs> not an experienced Fortnite player. Yeah, we've had some really interesting ones in recent... I, the one that I loved was the Canon one, because when mm. I first read it, I thought, wow, this is really interesting, and then realized that it was a total scam, so... Yeah, and they say, we really love your channel. It suits all our needs, so yeah, do please promote our Canon camera. Exactly. All right, then we have... Oh my goodness, we have super numbers. All right, well, that's the first chunk of information for this week. As I say, Nikon Q3 report we're going to talk about next week in a full swing of all the presentations and every single slide of that presentation from Nikon will be covered, I promise you. So three hours, just brace yourself. We're going to get there next week. Now, on SEPA numbers, those are the final ones for the year. So what are the important things? So compared to the last year, overall units shipped off cameras and lenses are higher. So last year, they've shipped 5.3 million of units. And this year, we are at 5.348 million units. So we are about 40 million units higher. Yeah. Mm. yeah. All right. So I'm going to do the maths this time. I think I can jazz it up a bit. Yeah. You're ready. You're ready. You've you've prepared yourself. Okay, this time you're going to do that. I'm going to do my Carol Vorderman impression from Countdown. No. So in 2021, the figures came in at 5.348 million units, which is actually 40 million units higher, almost exactly, to the year before in 2020. So in 2020, we they shipped 5.3 3 million and then 2019 we had a higher figure which was 8.4 2018 it was 10.7 2017 was 11.6 so my deduction is that we have been shipping lower numbers of units and i say we the collective we as in the world have been shipping the mind the, yeah exactly have been shipping lower units consistently for the last five years and 2021 is the first year that we've actually shipped more than a previous year so 
you know, that's that's a positive sign, right? Up is up. Up is up. Absolutely. So if you look at that, definitely up on those union ships. So now let's break them down to a DSLRs and mirrorless. So DSLRs are 5.6% down compared to the same amount last year. So we only shipped 2.2 million units compared to last year. And also the shipped value, how much they sold for, also declined by 5.6%. Now, mirrorless units have increased by 6% to 3.1 million units and the shipped value by 31% at 325 billion yen. So that's pretty good. And then we start to see decline in the sales of a smaller than full frame lenses. So we would call it DX. So they've shipped 8% less compared to last year. The shipped value is about the same, just 1% up. But the full frame and medium format lenses have increased by 27%. And the shipped value also increased by 49%, so almost 50%, at 263.2 billion yen. So if we now compare how much mirrorless sells over DSLRs, so if you look at that share, it's also increased. It's 58% now compared to 55% last year. Now, the shipped value, so the amount of money that actually they made, is 78% up compared to the last year's shipments. So that's quite a significant increase. It clearly tells us that the world is now is switching to mirrorless, including Nikon, including all other brands as well. Exactly. Uh, should we take a look at the geographic share? Absolutely. So if you look at DSLRs, so the Europe and states are still big spenders and the people who acquire the DSLRs the most. So Europe is at 38.1% and United States at 31.9% respectively. Now, Europe and America also, in terms of how much money they spend on DSLR, they're also about uh, the same and they're leaders in this respect. Now, if you look at the mirrorless, this is where it gets quite interesting. We actually get a nice spread between all continents. So if you look at Europe, we had 24.2% of shipped value. America, so that includes North America and I assume South America as well, at 25.8%. Now, China on its own at 22.4%, but actually if you combine it with Japan and Asia as well, so that would be at 40% plus. So that's quite a big chunk. So if you start to look at actually where Nikon cameras sell, they actually sell pretty much equally all over the world. So if you combine Europe and United Kingdom as well, United States and North America as well, so that we all roughly in the same position. And if you look at the value as well, how much money was spent on those cameras, again, there's no clear leader. We're all about the same. And then when it comes to lenses, it looks like it's similar figures, but not quite. Europe seems to take the 30% share. America's is slightly higher at 30.2. China is 16 and Asia is 12. Japan is eight. I mean, Asia doesn't include China and Japan in those figures, but it again, mm -hmm. looks like it's about 37%. So we've got sort of their split into thirds almost. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is, if you notice the amount of news coming from Asia nowadays on digital cameras and mirrorless cameras as well, the amount of news is quite big. And I'm not talking about just Japan as well. Obviously, those are Japanese manufacturers. We also talk China. Remember that a lot of interviews are now published with a Chinese, uh, let's say, Nikon marketing team or, let's say, a manager of Nikon China, etc., etc. So it seems like it's becoming a bigger player. Now, obviously, we live in an English-speaking world, and that's why we don't really know how much information is coming out there and how is, let's say, YouTube doing for Asian markets as well. But it's clear to see that Nikon is not just marketing for English world, it's also markets for Asian countries as well. Yeah, exactly. We have segued nicely into third-party news here. So there is actually a new Arca plate for the 100-400 VR and the 70-200 lenses that's been announced in Japan. Okay, yeah, they can be poured in Amazon Japan and I'm sure they will trickle down to the other markets, including Europe and the United States. So that is the attachment that goes on uh, the bottom of the tripod foot of 100-400 and it's also compatible with the 70-200 2.8S lenses. Now, remember when those lenses came out and um, not a lot of people but uh, you know I think you mentioned that you would prefer to have the tripod foot that is Arca Swiss compatible and some people mentioned as well so now the option is there it's not very expensive and it seems like if you look at the images that it's quite securely attached to the lens and it almost feels like it's flush with the lens and become one part. Excellent. 3,000 yen in pounds is 20 quid. Oh 20 pounds that's nothing. It's a bargain isn't it? Well, you remember that non Arca Swiss collar that came with that was an option with the 70 to 200 f4 and the 300 f4, the yeah. RT1, yeah. which is like mm -hmm. 150 pounds. 
and it wasn't Arca Swiss. I can no. tell you it was £169. And it wasn't Arca Swiss. So this is is very logical. I like that as a as a potential option. Absolutely, I agree. When the things are cheap and well made at the same time, it's really good. So that's why places like Small Rig nowadays compete very well on price with, let's say, Kirk or Really Right Stuff. Now, obviously, there may not be a 100% comparison in terms of quality, but what we can see is that those companies are improving all the time. And definitely, when you start to compare, and if the difference is not that big, then a lot of people will vote with their wallet. So now, coming back to CP+, which we mentioned with regards to H5 1.2 patent that we talked about earlier. So CP+, live event in Yokohama, has been now cancelled and it will go online only on the same date. Yeah, so the email says, we regret to inform you that the CP Plus 2022 venue event, which was scheduled to be held at Pacifico Yokohama for four days from February 24th, will be cancelled and that it will be held online independently. Now, that usually means we don't see Nikon release many things at online events from what I've gathered. So is that mm -hmm. why you mm -hmm. assume that we won't see the 85 mil released then? Absolutely. So CP Plus was a good big event uh, similar to CES in Las Vegas, which happens in January. So we normally have CES in January, then we have CP Plus in February. And generally, that's the time for Nikon announcements before the end of financial year at the end of March. So because it goes online only, it seems to me that they won't announce anything there, but we may still see it announced around that time. Again, we're talking about the end of the year. I personally expect we will see a proper release date for 800 mil and who knows, maybe they'll squeeze the H5 1.2 in at the same time. Speaking of other upcoming events, we also have the WPPI in Nevada, Las Vegas, scheduled from 27th to 3rd of March. So the WPPI is the Wedding and Portrait Photographers International Convention. So this one is seems to be still going between 27th and 3rd of March. So people who want to visit that show, they're welcome to do so. And then in UK, we also have Society of Photographers Convention, which is prior used to be called Society of Wedding Photographers Convention. So that one is still scheduled live in London from 16th of March till 19th of March 2022. Well, let's see if they actually manifest in reality or whether they'll move online. I think that for the London one, provided that nothing changes, we will still see as a live event because obviously for us in the UK, uh, although I'm not there right now, but for us in the UK, uh, restrictions have pretty much all but been eliminated. Absolutely. And remember that last time we went to um, a big expo, which was I think in September, we went to Birmingham to see some photographic equipment and we all hoped for that nine and it didn't happen there. How did you find that event? The photography Show. I was just thinking of the photography show actually when we were talking about that. I really enjoyed having a, a live human experience. Obviously we've been quite fortunate that we've had a lot of those since then because we also had Photo London shortly after that. So I don't think that online events hit the same way as in-person events. I did enjoy that experience and getting to see so many people and also to, you know, put hands on equipment, which is ultimately what you're there for. Absolutely. I agree with you. Well, the next photography show is scheduled for 17th of September. So who knows? Maybe we'll go there again. Yes. Birmingham. It's a Birmingham. It wasn't so bad. Could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> to my best middle oh, dear. I apologize to anyone from Birmingham for that. <laughs> Shame. 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 <laughs> okay, good. Now we're moving on. Moving on to reviews. We have a YouTube review by Chris Frost of the new Nikon Z 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8 lens. He's done a review with samples. So if you saw Matt Irwin's and you'd like to see another review on this lens, then do go check out Chris Frost. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of samples, we are waiting for our sample from Nick and hopefully it will be with us soon enough. So if Chris Frost did a review of 2875, Matt Irwin went the next step and he actually compared the 2875 with 24 72.8 S, F4S, and also 24 to 120 lens. He did real world comparisons. If you want to see his opinion, then do definitely check out his video. In short, he said that 24 to 120 is the way to go because it's a sweet spot between price, size, and the image quality at the same time. But for full review, do check his video. Excellent. Now, if you're interested in some camera comparisons with other brands, we have a DP review 
video comparing the Canon EOS R3 versus the Nikon Z9 and versus the Sony A1. So this is all the flagship bodies in comparison with one another. Yeah, I've watched it. I can't comment on the quality of it. Generally, I do like DP review, but I do recommend to go and check out a comment section under that YouTube video, as well as on DP review website. Obviously do it at your own risk, but it is an enjoyable read. Comment sections are always fun. As long as you can take everything with a pinch of salt. Absolutely. Definitely put the gloves on, the goggles, the hood, and then get in. That way you can come out unscathed. <laughs> Speaking of Z9 reviews, Martin Heilbronn published his review on the Z9. He calls it Nikon Z9, the DSLR is dead, which is quite a nice and, let's say, hyperbolic statement. But let's see. Very humble, not sensational at all. I definitely, he's a fan. <laughs> let's put it yes, that Yes, absolutely. Actually, the review itself is really good. And apparently part two is coming out shortly. But a part of the title, we do recommend this video. So... And uh, let's move on to We Can Read and Watch section. We've got Steve Perry published a very interesting video, which is called, Are Lens Hoods Raking Your Photos in Cold Weather? Remember lens hoods, Becky, the ones that we don't normally put on our lenses when we shoot on location. That's right, that we get sort of publicly ostracized for whenever we're not using a lens hood. So the quick answer is yes from Steve, but do have a look at the video for a full explanation. I'm very much of the don't put the lens hood on unless it's actually sunny camp. I know that a lot of people think that if you don't have your lens hood on, you're not a professional photographer. Well, it's debatable. <laughs> Run away, Becky, run. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that and go. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Shots fired. But actually, this one, the issue one, because this is to do with the heat dispersion. And remember, let's say if you're shooting somewhere in Safari, which is really hot, you may find that because of the heat, you may find that the image is not sharp. So this is actually very similar what happens in the cold. So while it's not hot, so you shouldn't have any heat dispersion at all, when you put the lens hood on, so between the outside of the lens hood and the end of the lens hood, which is attached to the lens, it may create a similar effect that is on the heat. So he shows the examples there. I personally didn't know that, so it's very interesting. So I would definitely recommend you this video because it's not something that any photographer would know maybe one of them, and it wouldn't be me. <laughs> it was Steve Perry. Next up, we have eagles in southern Sweden photographed from a hide. This is wildlife photography, obviously, with the Nikon Z6 II, and it's by Halmstad Photo, Goran Johansson. Yeah, this is the video just to show you that in post Z9 world, the other Nikon cameras can still do wildlife photography. And in this case, it's a Z6 Mark II. I approve this message. Absolutely. It's not just about cameras and technical specifications, about the as used photographer. And I'm pretty sure that if you want to, you can still shoot a wildlife with a film camera and manual focus lens. Yes, it's true. You just said, you, you, just, you just went like this, but... <laughs> No, I mean, yes, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you absolutely right. <laughs> and that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Yes, thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube. Give us a follow, perhaps even a review if you're listening on a podcast platform. Absolutely. Just a quick note. So on Apple Podcasts, we're doing really well. But on Spotify, we don't have any ratings. So if you do listen to podcasts on Spotify skip the Joe Rogan one. But if you do listen to us on Spotify, please leave us a rating as well. Yeah, we'd very much appreciate it. And if you want to find us on Instagram, apparently Becky is traveling the world. You can find us at... You can hardly find me traveling the world, but you can find me at Rebecca underscore Danese and you can find Con at... Konstin Kochkin. Nice and simple. Absolutely. Fantastic. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.